Hello, and welcome to the second part of my fifth installment of the Peter Hamill videos. I apologize for the technical glitch in the last video. My camera actually uh, it, it died on me uh, just as I finished talking about the first side of PH7. Uh, but seeing how the title PH7 is a reference to the uh, balance point between acidity and alkalinity, the absolute middle, I thought it might be uh, that it was appropriate enough that I should just carry on uh, the video starting out with the second side of PH7. So um, I will start this video by talking about uh, side 2 of pH 7. So um, it of course opens with the old school tie, which is um, a great piece. It's I, I really get a new wave kind of feel from this one. However, it's um, a very sparse arrangement. There's no drums or anything on it, just uh, that stark piano. Bun dun 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 um, and uh, there's a bit of bass in there, and uh, there's some guitar embellishments as well, but it's a very, very bare-bones kind of arrangement for it, but it still has that kind of new wave, rocky feel to it. Um, and it's a great piece. Uh, of course, uh, some of the social lyrics are coming through on that one once again, talking about uh, politicians, young politicians, you know, going out uh, to find themselves a cushy job in politics. While they may start out as idealists, they all kind of get sucked into the uh, into the gears of that uh, whole world and, and whatnot. Um, and it, it's a, it's a great tune. I particularly like the bridge. I like I like how it all kind of breaks down, gets very atmospheric. We hear some guitar tones and some extra synth tones. I like the um, uh, choral vocals that kind of come in the middle. It's a nice build up back into the tune. Uh, so yeah, it's a great, a great song. Very um, um, representative of this era for sure. And then we go on to track two of side two, uh, which is of course time for a change. Now this is another uh, Chris Judge Smith cover. So he, he'd already done uh, been alone so long at this point, and um, this is uh, another one of uh, Judge Smith's tracks. Ju Judge Smith's tracks. And uh, it's a great piece. Uh, Hamill's played this live uh, quite regularly, actually, uh, since this album's release. And uh, it's 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 a good song. I particularly like um, how how his voice changes for each verse. You get that low kind of baritone for for one verse. You get the kind of choral bits for another verse. And then you kind of get the call and response towards the end, which is uh, really really cool. It's neat. kind of like multiple characters of the same song. Um, and musically, it's quite interesting too. Just these arpeggiated guitar lines, but um, it almost has a, a western feel to it uh, when I hear it. I mean, Hamill's work is very typically uh, European, I would say. But um, Time for a Change definitely has a it's like a country western feel. It's not a country. It's not a it's not a country and western song. It's not a country song by any means, but just the sound of the guitar and the arrangement. It sounds like an old western movie or something. But uh, it's a great track for sure. Um, then we go on to Imperial Walls. Uh, now this is this is a significant song. This is um, kind of more akin to the wild stuff on the future now, uh, but not quite as crazy as like a motorbike in Africa or, or medieval. But it's a really good song. Very slow and very brooding. I think there's some slowed down drum machine sounds in there uh, to give it that brooding kind of a feel to it. And, Lots of kind of awkward synth tones and guitar tones, and um, what's really really cool about it is the uh, the lyrical content, which is actually a translation from a passage that was carved in rock by an eighth century Saxon, um, which uh, according to there's some some notes that Hamill's written about the album, and I think he, he was visiting visiting the site in Bath and um, um, there inscribed and translated was was uh, what would become the lyrics to Imperial Walls, which is uh, which is quite cool. It's a very interesting concept, and it's especially interesting how, you know, this, this ancient writing fits perfectly on top of the, the crazy soundscapes and whatnot. But um, I love the track. Very, very experimental. Towards the end is really good. I love the whole stanza at the end of the... Um, uh, till a hundred generations of men pass away, that bit's really good. Then the high bit at the end is cool. It's a very long fade out too, so um, yeah, just a great, great experimental track and uh, again, uh, representative of the era for sure. And then the album uh, wraps up with um, kind of a pseudo epic of sorts, with two songs being the key components. We have Mr. X Gets Tense and Faculty X, and um, it's not so much, you know, a, a singular epic in and of itself, However, it is a, um, um, you know, it, it's a pair of songs that do go together one way or another, and they're and they're fantastic. Um, you get some of the, the the sheer soundscape effects in the, that's in there. You get some uh, some of the full full band styles with Hamill on the drums, doing his crazy quirky drum thing, 
And uh, yeah, it's, it's really good. So Mr. X starts out with this kind of hurricane sound of just noise and, uh, you know, j just craziness. It's, it's like a tornado or a hurricane coming through the, through the speakers. And um, eventually the piano comes in, the drums come in, and we get this really, really cool piece. We have uh, Graham Smith on violin as well as David Jackson on saxophone. So it is a, um, you know, a full band style track for sure. And um, yeah, again, it, it, it's it's very. It, I mean, it, it feels very modern, at least you know, for for 1979. It's it, it's it's contemporary. It's up to date. So you know, he's keeping up with uh, with the times, and he's and he's setting trends too. It's the experimental albums like this that are, of course, you know, proved to be so influential. But um, yeah, I love the whole under fire, under ice thing uh, that, that goes along with Mr. X. And uh, yeah, just a just a great track. Uh, and again, the uh, Hamill's Hamill's drums certainly add to the charm of it. But they're no by no means um, you know it's by no means the work of a professional drummer. But you can tell he's having fun, and it's uh, and it suits the track. It adds the adds to the charm. And then we have that hurricane noise come in uh, once again, and that leads us into Faculty X, which is again, I mean, it feels like a kind of a, like a an epic sort of thing, like a, a faint heart in the sermon. But it's not as you know. Um, you know, it's still dramatic and energetic, but in a, in a very different way, not in a dogmatic way. And th again, there's a different voice to these tracks um, with, with Faculty X. I mean, even even just the way that he phrases certain things, like you know, gotta be the Faculty X. That's such a that's such a fresh thing for Hamill at this point. Um, and it's just a really good energetic track. So there's there's no drums on Faculty X, but we still have uh, David Jackson and um, Graham Smith playing along there. And uh, it's just a really really good energetic, um, you know epic really. Uh, I particularly liked some of the lyrics towards the end where he talks about, you know, I pluck all these characters out of thin air and, um, you know, he's, he's kind of talking, you know, talking a bit about his craft, uh, kind of like how uh, in Palinurus and, uh, and The Cut and what they do on uh, The Future Now. Um, and I, yeah, I, I like how he kind of talks about, you know, his craft and that, you know, a lot of these songs are, you know, he's, he's essentially creating fictitious characters that are going through whatever situation that the song is trying to express. And, um, you know, because Hamill has such a dramatic vocal style, I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, you know, what he does is acting. He's acting out the songs. Uh, and I think that that last line of Faculty X is kind of a good representation of that. I really like the end, too. It's a very sweeping, you know, um, almost mysterious ending. And again, there's some really nice uh, sax work and violin work with uh, that, those last few bars. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a great album, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I'm still a big fan of, uh, um, of PHM, but I think, you know, between these two, the future now is definitely the winner. Um, they do go together. They are kind of a pair of albums, I think. Um, but on the other hand, like I said, songs like Faculty X and, um, Portent Down are stronger than sort of the individual songs on the future now. I think the future now is still, you know, hold better together as an album. But uh, anyway, that's it for uh, PH7. Now we move on to a very special album indeed, um, a black box. Uh, now this this might be uh, this might be one of my all-time favorite Hamill solo records. Uh, this is kind of you know I might be might sound crazy for saying this, but it's kind of like the pawn hearts of Hamill's solo career. It's uh, it's it, it, he reaches a certain apex, and again similarly to you know the the early '70s solo albums, you can see uh, the future now and PH7 as being sort of research and development, and then this is kind of the the finished product. Um, Another notable thing about this album, of course, is it's the first album that was released um, not on the Charisma label. So uh, Charisma, and of course, famously Tony Stratton Smith, were, were huge, huge supporters of Vandergroth and Hamill uh, back in the you know, late 60s, early 70s. And um, by the time we get to 1980 with uh, A Black Box, um, he was no longer on the Charisma label. So uh, this was actually released on a label called Stereotype Records, which was formed with... Um, Gail Coulson, I believe, and she uh, ended up being his manager for many, many, many years after this. But um, it's interesting that this album, this sort of, you know, uh, an apex of sorts in his career, was was uh, not released on a major label. But um, yeah, like like I was saying before, the this being the finished product, we really kind of see this as, um, or I really kind of see this, I should say, as being something as a foundation for the rest of Hamill's career as a solo artist, you know. PH7 and, and The Future Now, it's, we, we see him putting everything, including the kitchen sink, into the mix to try and find something that's, um, you know, 
still has a vitality to it, but doesn't lean on the Vandergraaff thing. And I think this represents, you know, all of the means with which he was able to um, work with as a solo artist. So uh, it's it's a big big moment, I think. And uh, as, as as an album, it's, it's it's fantastic as well. We get we get just about every every aspect of Hamill's um, solo work. We get some rock stuff. We get some piano type stuff. There's a great acoustic guitar song. Lots of sheer experimental noise. And most notably, we have um, the epic flight, uh, which takes up the entire second side of the album. And uh, we'll talk about that as we uh, go into the tracks. So uh, side one opens with Golden Promises. And uh, this is just a fantastic song. Again, we it opens right off the bat with Hamill on the drums and uh, that really kind of stiff, crazy style. But again, it suits the track. It, it um, um, you know it adds a certain charm to it. I will say, however, the the sound of the drums particularly contribute to the sort of um, almost sounds has a garage band sort of quality. But again, adds to the charm. I think it's it's a stronger production value than Chameleon in the Shadow of the Night. But it's still not you know. It's it's not strong compared to you know a Peter Gabriel album for for example, but um, it doesn't matter because the songs are the bread and butter of of uh, what Hamill's all about, right? So uh, so that that's all in intact. Golden promises. I mean lyrically, it's um, you know you go for the golden promises and it's hook sinker and line. So I guess it's 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 people falling for certain things, whether it be you know marketing or religious or uh, I don't want to analyze the lyrics too too much as you know but um, yeah it, it's just a great song I particularly like the, towards the end how it, it all kind of slows down you can hear Hamill trying to get those bass drum notes in um, and it still sounds you know pretty cohesive and tight he still has that band feel I mean really it's when, when you when you consider how um, you know, Peter Hamill himself will admit he's not really much of a musician. The, the instruments that he uses are really tools for finding songs rather than, you know, I mean, he's not a guitar player that's going to spend hours a day, you know, refining his craft to uh, become a great technician or anything like that. You know, it's just a way to find a song. So when you, you know, you take into account that this is, you know, pretty well truly a solo album apart from a few contributions, you know, tiny contributions. I mean, he's playing all the instruments here. He's playing the drums, the bass, the piano, the guitar, he's doing all the vocals and whatnot. And you, you, you realize this is, you know, quite an accomplishment all once again in his home studio. So, um, yeah, uh, that was the first track, Golden Promises. The second track of the album, Losing Faith in Words, is, uh, is a fantastic track. This is one that has been played live a fair bit, actually. And, um, it's uh, the classic kind of piano track, but it's that's that new wavy vibe again. You know, it's 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 kind of like um, a souped-up version of the old school tie because now we do have drums and we do have a bit more of a, a fuller arrangement. Um, the the middle section of losing faith in words is particularly interesting because we've got some very awkward um, rhythmic changes and there's some funny time signatures going on. And I mean, me myself as a drummer, I find it very difficult to actually. Uh, figure out exactly what Hamill's doing to navigate those odd time signatures, but he still does it really, really well. I mean, uh, as the drums go through it, I'm thinking of the uh, dun 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 dun. That's that's the part I'm thinking of. It, it's a it's a particularly weird thing, and uh, just the way that Hamill has figured out how to get through it on the drums, I I I, I can't quantify it in my brain for whatever reason. Um, also notable about this song is, of course, the lyrical content, which I think um, starts a, a long, long-running thread talking about um, communication and, uh, and our inability to uh, properly grasp the languages that we that we speak, uh, which is a, a really, really good thread. And that, that can go. That, that's a thread that goes all the way up to uh, incoherence and has continued on since then. But I think incoherence certainly represents the peak of uh, songs about language and uh, communicating and whatnot. But um, yeah, losing faith. In words is a great track for sure. Moving on to track three, we get into some of the bizarre, crazy material. This is the Jargon King, and uh, easily one of my favorite tracks on the album for sure. It is a really, really good song. Um, again, this is music from a completely other planet. This is, um, you know, some of the, sort of the peak of his wild experimentation, and at least in terms of you know being crafting a song out of sheer noise. We get that. Um, crazy, you know, I think it's a, it's a drum machine set to a ridiculous speed and you get this kind of shaking, shaking sound 
and um, kind of similar to a motorbike in Africa, but this isn't meant to sound like a motorbike, it's just this weird, bubbling, gurgling, crazy noise. Uh, lyrically on top, we've got some cool topics. Again, talking about language and uh, someone who uses too much jargon to the point that no one can understand them. And uh, again, the, the music behind it is, is so, so fitting. I, I like there's a part where the synthesizer comes up, and again, it's all coordinated with the vocal lines really nicely. And this, the way this is pulsating synth, synth line comes in, this is this is brilliant. Of course, it was performed live by the K Group. We'll talk about that in another video, um, and that that's a really cool version of that as well. Anyway, moving on, we get to Fog Walking, track four of the album, and this is the other it's kind of you know soundscapey experimental track. This is a really really good one too. Um, just a very slow, brooding, um, you know, drum machine beat and very atmospheric layers on top. We got David Jackson on saxophone, and uh, it's just a fantastic, creepy, creepy, creepy piece. Love the, the very visual imagery in the lyrics, too. You're talking about Whitechapel, and you get that sort of, um, there's a Jack the Ripper kind of a feel to it. There's a great chord progression that comes through as well for the chorus when he actually sings Fog Walking. Um, and another another absolute highlight on the album. Very, you know, could be a highlight of his career, I think, as a solo artist. Love fog walking. Really good stuff. Um, and then from there we get to track five, which is the spirit. And this is um, placed very well on the album. We get a nice bit of um, sonic relief after we have the Jargon King and fog walking. These kind of very experimental, noisy tracks. Uh, we get a nice little acoustic pop song, really. And um, it's the the arrangement is very full. We have the the drums are on there. We got the bass. It's essentially a full band that uh, we we have um, performing on here. Um, and it is you know essentially just a, a classic you know Peter Hamill acoustic guitar song. I will say though I, I I sometimes question whether this song needs the full production. It might be a great song just as the acoustic guitar. Uh, but I have yet to hear a version of that song that uh, doesn't have the drums or the bass or anything like that. But um, yeah, just a, a nice little pop song and a nice breath of um, you know some breathing room on the album after the experimental stuff. Uh, what follows, track six, we have In Slow Time. Another very experimental track, very atmospheric, very synthy. This is actually a collaboration with um, David Ferguson is the guy's name. Um, and he was in a band who, uh, whose name escaped me right now, but uh, Hamill had done some work, I believe, as a producer with this band, I think. And, um, and that's how they got to know each other, and uh, they collaborated to create this piece. Really, really good. Again, it's, it's, um, it's, like, it's the experimental end of things, um, once again, but it's not quite as intense as Fog Walking or The Jargon King. It's very slow and chill. Um, I love the, the, the processed uh, tambourine that kind of pulses through it, which is really nice. There's a very cool version of In Slow Time that uh, you can find on YouTube. I actually saw this version before I got the album. But it's got this weird kind of choreographed stuff happening. Hamill's in the center and there's, there's two people that are doing this weird dance. Um, and it, there's a different vocal take on that version. So if you can find you know, Peter Hamill in slow time, live, 1980 or something, I don't know, check it out because it's, uh, it's a cool alternate take. Um, but yeah, yeah, in slow time is a, is a fantastic track. I'm a fan of that one. And then side one closes with The Wipe, which is actually an instrumental. Uh, I believe that's the first you know, instrumental that's ever been on a Peter Hamill solo album. It's kind of not a common thing. Uh, but it's just some epic sheer noise, stuff that would uh, you, could, you could later see on like some of the Sonics albums or something like that. It's only like a minute and a half long, very, very short, and it kind of serves as a coda to that whole first collection of songs, as a segue into the second side, which is quite notable. Um, we'll talk about that in a sec. The Wipe is really, really cool, though. I love, I love the... Um, Kind of sound like the synths that sound like sirens. It's got the the crazy drum beat, drum machine patterns and whatnot. I think that I think that might actually be um, an actual symbol. He's kind of using samples, uh, a really early in use of that. Possibly, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how a lot of this stuff was put together. But the wipe is really cool. Uh, like I said, it serves as a segue into the second side, which we flip over. Gotta love all the uh, the handwritten lyrics there. Hope the screen's not too blurry for you to to, to see there, but. Yes, we flip the side over, and we get side two, which is, of course, Flight. The, uh, this is the second proper long-form piece that Hamlet attempted. Obviously, the first is A Plague of Lighthouse Keepers from Pond Hearts. Um, and 
Plate is the first one to be released on a Peter, Sol a Peter Hamill solo uh, album. And uh, it is a fantastic, fantastic song. Um, you know, obviously the first two, the first couple albums I talked about feature now in PH7. They, they do, they are reaching away from Van der Generator. And I think it's, you know, looking at Flight, it's a 19 minute song. You could say this is sort of leaning towards Van der to a certain extent. And obviously by 1980, it was clear that Van der was done for good. Of course, not, not true. They are, they are alive and well today. Um, but I think he felt secure enough in his own, you know, ability as a solo performer that he could kind of, you know, nod to the band a little bit. That being said, I think Flight is also a distinctively solo thing. It's not nearly as dark or, um, dare I say, oppressive as a piece like um, A Plague of Lighthouse Keepers. It is definitely a little bit lighter. And um, it's a bit smoother as well. I mean, not necessarily smooth in terms of the transition. Some of the, the different sections of the piece, they are quite jarring. They do, they do um, change quite abruptly. There's a couple of cases of that. But um, the music itself is smoother. And even, even kind of the crazy sections of the piece aren't quite as um, uh, crazy or freaky as, as the Van der Graaff stuff. Um, of course, we do have David Jackson on the piece. He, he makes a couple of moments here and there, which is, which is really good, right in the middle of the song. And uh, it's it's just fantastic lyrically. Um, I think you could you could look at it literally as being about you know someone in a plane and you know they're getting through turbulence, whatever. It's it that you could say it as, as being a flight, but there's also the idea that this is a flight through life. Um, it's it's a metaphor, as of, of course, as all of all of Hamill's uh, stuff is. But it's a great metaphor, and it's it's a it, it's a you know it, it's a fantastic piece. So we'll break it down, we'll go through each of the sections real quick. So it opens with the Flying Blind section, which is a great, great intro to the piece. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just this nice, slow, classic Peter Hamill piano piece. And um, introduces a couple of key themes that do get reintroduced later. Again, something that isn't really, doesn't really happen with the Plague of Lighthouse Keepers. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's a really, really good intro. That leads us into the White King Fandango, which is the first kind of crazy section. I love that pi the, the the piano bed, and uh, the way that it kind of it, it slowly comes into the sonic space, and then we get that awkward rhythm that goes underneath it as well is really good. And the vocals on top are fantastic. It's a it's a it's a good madness madness section, but it's more controlled than a Van der Graaff generator mad madness section, right? So um, so that's interesting. Then we get to the kind of core center of the song, really. We have Control, which is um, back into the, uh, the piano um, mind, mind, mind frame of things. And um, it's almost whimsical at times. I particularly like the section, um, you know, but I still don't know. And you just get the you know, nice space in that little piano line. That dun, 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 dun. It's really, really nice. Very tasteful stuff. And that winds us into uh, the cockpit, se cockpit section. So this is where things are, you know, sort of building up towards the big uh, finale at the end. Again, we get that real new wave, rocky kind of vibe, which I think is great. It's um, a nice little um, kind of an intro to what follows later with the K group, actually. And uh, this leads us to Silkwork, Silkworm Wings, which is a very short section of the song, but it serves, serves as a segue into the, uh, the grand finale. Silkworm, Silkworm Wings is very um, operatic, and it's, uh, everything kind of winds its way up, and it's, uh, it's really good. Nothing is Nothing is the second sort of madness section. It's almost got a bluesy vibe. Still got the mad piano going on over top as well. It's a, it's a nice... Um, kind of peak of the tension of the song, if you like. And then uh, that brings us to the final section, the closing section of Flight, which is called A Black Box. And um, this is a really, really nice, it's almost like a coda to the album. And, um, you know, I love the imagery running down the looping line of DNA. This is where, you know, we, we talk about, you know, flight as being, you know, the, the flight is life itself, you know, a journey, a journey through space and time. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 really really good. Um, again, with with the production value, the the I think the original version, while it is very very good, it does suffer from that kind of weaker production. But fortunately, there are a couple of different versions of Flight which are fantastic. Of course, there's one on um, oh I'm not gonna find it in there uh, on the margin, which is by performing the K group. It is a really really good version. But we also have uh, an excellent version on this. Merlin Atmos. 
I've got the vinyl version of that, which just contains live renditions of um, Plague of Lighthouse Keepers and Flight in 2013. I saw Van der Graaff in 2012, and I did see them perform Flight, which was uh, definitely a highlight of the show. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see uh, Lighthouse Keepers, but Flight was fantastic. I had no complaints whatsoever. Really, really good stuff. And uh, that wraps up a black box. So, um... Yeah, I mean, like this very notable album, but one of my one of my favorites in uh, in his solo career for sure, and it is um, it uh, represents something of a high water mark in terms of um, the experimental side of things, but it also serves as a great foundation that it would be laid out for the rest of his career, and um, yeah, certainly a favorite of mine. So uh, that concludes uh, part two of the fifth installment of blah 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 blah. The Peter Hamill videos. Thank you very much for tuning in. And sorry again about the technical glitch that came with this episode. Their videos are getting too long, I guess. But uh, stay tuned for the next video, which will be talking about uh, the K group. So that'll be sitting targets, enter K. Um, patience and also talk about the margin and the margin plus and the k box as well which is a recent release so stay tuned for all of that hopefully that won't be in two parts and uh blah 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 appreciate the uh tolerating of the incoherent rambling i'm really rambling now so don't forget to like subscribe comment etc etc thank you very much see you next time